Welcome everyone. This is Sarah from CuraSMA's Community Support Department. We're so glad to have you join us for tonight's career panel webinar series presentation. In this series, our panelists will share their career experiences, advice, and ideas that can be helpful and inspirational to all members of the SMA community. Thank you so much to our presenting sponsor, Biogen, for generously supporting this series. We appreciate all of the questions that we received in advance of this webinar, and we'll try to answer many of these in the next hour. You're also able to submit questions uh, throughout the webinar using the questions box, which you'll find located on your GoToWebinar toolbar. Also, all lines will remain muted during the webinar other than for the speakers. We would like to formally note that the views and or advice expressed during these webinars do not represent the opinion of CuraSMA. If you have any additional questions after tonight's panel, please contact CuraSMA's community support team at community support at curasma.org. We would now like to welcome our speakers, Jim Willison, Jenny Gold, Brian Ronigan, and Christina Gossett Kelly. Jim will be starting today with an overview of his career panel thus uh, career path thus far. Jim. Well, thank you. First off, I appreciate the opportunity to share my story and thank Biogen and, of course, the, the people at the families of SMA who, um, back when I was first diagnosed, was called, uh, I said families of SMA. I meant to say Cure SMA. Uh, so I, I go back quite a few years. I was first diagnosed back in 1977, although it wasn't really a diagnosis back then. It was just more of a, a hospital stay. So I've been battling this thing for a long time. I guess one of the things that that I wanted to share is the fact that sometimes you need to change. Uh, you can start off on a career path that may or may not be the best, and um, you just uh, you regroup and, and make new decisions. Um, I was fortunate enough uh, when I was in high school to get contacted, connected with a local radio station, and so uh, I worked in commercial broadcast for several years, and uh, then after multiple station format changes and uh, the the love of radio, if you will, went away, had an opportunity to work with Motorola and uh, worked with them as a field engineer. Uh, I have an engineering degree from DeVry University. And so I was the field engineer for public safety radio dispatch centers. And then one day they said, all engineering is going to come from Chicago. And I had no desire to move to Chicago. We had two little girls and uh, had made our second house payment on a house we just built. So uh, we weren't going. So what I did was I started my own business. And uh, essentially it was doing Doing what I did for Motorola, doing engineering design work for public safety dispatch centers. It uh, anytime that there's a change, move, or upgrade to a 911 center, uh, those people need some engineering expertise, but they don't need somebody like me on staff. And so I was just a consultant for, I believe, uh, from 1988 until uh, just about five years ago. And so what I did was I traveled the Midwest. Anytime there was a change, move, or upgrade to a 911 center, I would go in, find out what they wanted to do and uh, write the specifications, work with the vendors, and oversee the project. So I went from project to project, uh, working with uh, police, radio, uh, fire, EMS, EMA people, uh, and of course, uh, dealing with county commissioners, mayors, um, uh, a lot of public uh, elected officials. Um, and, and then it, the disease obviously was taking its toll as time went on. And uh, one day I was driving back from South Bend and in the middle of the road was a uh, snow plow with a trailer full of salt on its side in the middle of the roadway. And I thought, you know, it's time that uh, maybe I ought to be looking for something else because if that were me and I was in the middle of the of the road sideways in my car, uh, you know, getting me out would, would, would have been difficult. So uh, again, I made another transition to doing some voice work. And so what I do now is I um, do a lot of commercial uh, explainer videos, training videos, uh, things that you see and, and hear on either the internet or a radio and TV. It's worked out well, uh, partly because uh, with the advent of uh, good software and, of course, the internet, uh, I can be sitting here in my house and um, yeah, I connect with a uh, recording or an advertising agency in St. Louis, and the commercial uh, is for a customer in Dallas, Texas, and we can all be on the line. I can do the voiceover work, and they can direct me and make sure that it's uh, exactly what they want. So uh, it, with this particular job that I'm doing now, it doesn't matter where I am as long as I've got um, a good, quiet place to record in, uh, that I've got 
a cell phone with the same number so people can reach me, and of course, most importantly, a good internet connection. So that's what I do today. This is just a lot of voiceover work for explainer videos, training videos, commercials. Um, you know, every day's every day's different. Yesterday, I had somebody call me at four o'clock and say, "Hey, can you do this thing? I need 15 second video, and I got to have it in, in in 30 minutes. Can you do it?" And I just happened to be able to be done for the day with what I needed to do. And I said, yep. So I recorded it, sent it to him. Um, and then today I sent him a bill for it. And sometimes it works that way. Sometimes it doesn't. But uh, I've just been able to um, change and, and modify and, and do the things that uh, that suit me the best. So that's 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 my 40-year story in like two minutes. So I'll, there you go. Thanks, Jim. So um, I'm Brian Ronigan. And uh, first, I want to say I'm really good at predictions because right before we started, I predicted the minute this webcast starts, my son is going to be out of his room walking back and forth, I think four times uh, just as we got started. And then I figured out how to zoom the camera in so we don't see him so much. So, um, you know, Jim has a, a theme in his, it, you know, it's you know adaptability. So um, that's also true with mine, I think. You know, I, I've got SMA2. Uh, could never walk. They had a hard time diagnosing it as a kid. They kind of guessed for quite a while, but you know, it very slowly got progressively worse. And they, at one point in high school, I figured, oh, I'm gonna actually have to pay attention to school and maybe go to college, which I didn't want to, because if I wanted a job that I could do, it really could be based on physical attributes. So got into college. Um, Got into computer science, didn't like that. Got into astronomy, liked that. Couldn't handle calculus. I eventually ended up in uh, psychology, something called industrial organizational psychology, which is basically the way humans behave in organizations. So my my job now is with 3M, and I work in uh, HR. So it's applicable in that in that way. But you know, going back to school. Um, you know, trying to do well, because I knew at that point, I probably, as I got weaker, I'd have to be a very competitive job market. Uh, so I went to grad school and that would have more of a business focus. So I was entirely trying to focus my my outcome with school to a job market where I could get a, a, a good job. Luckily, it, it worked out that way because 3M came to campus and recruited. I was lucky enough to get hired. So that was, 1995 and since then my career has been entirely with 3m um they've moved me around the country a bit uh, a couple different plant assignments um, realized during that first plant assignment in knoxville iowa that nothing i learned in school was going to help me here it was <laughs> total trial by fire um and it was interesting just you know the accessibility of manufacturing plants in the midwest was important and something that they thought about as I as I progressed through the um, through the different plants. Um, I think over that time uh, I've had just about every type of HR role uh, in HR that one can have. I've been a generalist, I've been in uh, workforce planning, specialist jobs, compensation, all sorts of all sorts of different roles within HR. Um, during that time, I think, you know, I progressively got weaker, always had to adapt, um, always had to, you know, when ne needed, ask for accommodations, um, even even so much as the, the kind of role that I would have to make sure that I wouldn't have any difficulties with it. So I've been lucky in that regard. 3 has always been very responsive. So today I currently uh, support the uh, global R&D organization at 3M and uh, having a good time, still enjoying work. So thank you and looking forward to the panel. Hey, I'm I'm Jenny Gold. Um, started, I guess my first love of the film and business and movies was, you know, as a kid watching them. And also I did um, in Miami where I was growing up, I did a lot of the on-camera work with the muscular dystrophy telethons, um, which got me exposed to the cameras and the lighting and everything that was going on behind the scenes is what was most interesting to me. So when I finally transferred to a school 
it wasn't just college prep. There was more, had, you know, newer, modern stuff. They had a TV um, class, a TV program in the high school that would do morning news or the second hour was more creative and you could do your own shows. So immediately I got a friend and we started producing uh, and shooting and editing our own morning news show, but we had the freedom to skip class and, and go interview anybody that was famous that came to the little town in, in, uh, that we had moved to in uh, Fort Myers, Florida. And so after that, I set my sights on on the film business. You know, always loving and having a passion for, for movies and TV, I thought, well, I'm going to go to UCLA in California, and I'm going to um, you know, follow this. And I started getting the DGA magazines because the library at the school had it. And I was like, wow, this is cool. And I was just devouring that and cinematography magazines. And and then I realized, yeah, maybe traveling across the country to go to school might be a little bit much to bite off. And I read an article that in Orlando, Florida, uh, they were opening a new film school at the University of Central Florida. So I set my sights on that, ended up double majoring in, in motion picture technology and television. Um, in film school, I had a couple of award-winning shorts. One won a student Emmy, which was, you know, an, another trip out. I'd come out to LA before uh, on, a, on a family vacation. And, and then this one, I came out to get that award and really re-energized my, my understanding of the business. And really at that time, it was either New York or LA and I don't do snow. As I said, I'm a Miami, a Miami girl. I do, I do warm weather only. Um, but California had, had, you know, the heart of the industry. So um, after graduating college, I shot my first, um, the, the award-winning short that got the Emmy led me to my first feature. The idea being, well, a 30-minute short, it features just three times that, but it, it's actually to the third power. But um, doing that first feature film, I got into the Director's Guild, which was a, a long-time goal. And... Um, I started my career and came out to Los Angeles uh, to post it. Started, we did so good on posting our film with very little money that other people started asking us to help them with their films and post produce their films. Uh, and then we realized that we were, even though California was kind of scary because the cost of living was about four times was it what, what it was back in Florida, we were making five times that we could make before because we were actually getting paid for, for doing some of these things for other people's films. So came out here uh, and and uh, at that point, a lot of the people from my film school had already been out here. So it wasn't like we were coming out without people that we knew in town and uh, decided that I needed to establish myself better than other companies that, you know, or the other people that were, you know, meeting at Starbucks, I wanted to um, have an office. And we had done a lot of work with Universal. And uh, long story short, we ended up getting an office there uh, on the back lot and launching Gold Pictures um, at that time, which is, uh, I guess that would have been 19, uh, 2000. Um, and Jeff and I, um, my husband now, at the time we had, the joke was, you know, people kept saying, when are you going to get married? And we kept making another film and blowing the money. So once we came out here and got established, we had enough to get married. So we ended up uh, getting married and continuing our careers. And uh, we now um, recently did a big documentary that you may have heard about called Cinemability, the Art of Inclusion which has Ben Affleck, Jimmy Fox, uh, Tola Peep, um, Gina Davis, Jane Seymour, and a host of others, um, which is about the, the film business and how we've been represented from the early silent movies to today. And 
yeah, so the journey is always continuing. Um, as a director with a disability, there are only really two in the Directors Guild of America. Um, one is Ben Lewin, who directed the sessions, which you may have seen, which is an amazing guy. He's a friend and kind of a mentor, and, and I'm the only other one. I'm sure there's people in the Directors Guild that have non-visible disabilities, but because um, filming a motion picture uh, uh, is uh, tricky to get people to even hire a woman, let alone someone who uses a wheelchair, um, the odds are, are kind of um, tricky. So people don't want to admit that. Um, even going to film school, I had a professor that said, do you know what your odds are as a woman? And you want to be a director? It's crazy. And I said, well, I don't care what you think. I'm going to do it because this is what I'm passionate about. Yeah, I kind of believe in the old thing. If you find work that you're passionate about, you'll never actually work a day in your life. You'll enjoy what you do. And I can't imagine doing anything else, um, being on set and, and uh, you know, everything. You know, in film school, I, I knew that I couldn't follow the path of my peers. I went to school with like the Blair Witch guys and other people who, some of them were starting off as production assistants, PAs, and that's a lot of sweeping up and getting coffee and a lot of physical stuff like that. And I knew that wasn't going to be the path for me. So I better learn how to write and edit. And so I, I worked as an editor actually through school, which allowed me to have better equipment. And, and then I learned to write because then I could own the material that I could then hire myself as a director. Um, most of the work I've had out here has not been from other people hiring me to direct, but me creating the projects and being a producer to, to uh, get them. We do get a lot of work in post-production and other elements of the business because in the film business, you have to wear a lot of hats. But um, that's what we're doing, and we're loving every minute of it. So looking forward to talking to everybody today. Hi, I'm Katrina Gossett-Kelly. Um, I am an attorney with a large law firm, um, Gregory Drinker, which has offices across the United States and in a few other countries. Um, I practice in business litigation and um, I have a couple of different focuses in my practice. I practice on um, trade secret work, which is kind of the juicy side of business litigation where we actually deal with, you know, possible theft of trade secrets and things like that. So it's the, the juicier part of my work. And then e-discovery, which is kind of sounds drier, but I really enjoy it where we work with just the massive amounts of documents that people create nowadays and try to get our hands around it. Um, my career, so I don't think when I was in high school that this is where I thought I would be. Um, when I was in high school, I really wanted to be an actress, actually. That was kind of my dream was to be on my own sitcom and doing my own thing. Um, but I I always kind of wanted to have a backup plan because I knew I wanted to have food and a place to live. And I knew that my odds were not as good if I pursued acting. But I went to um, Notre Dame for college and um, I studied theater there. Um, but I also minored in science, technology, and values where I studied things like the ethics of medicine and the history of technology, um, really interesting things. And so I kind of diversified my interests so that I would, you know, be a more interesting person, I guess. And um, I went to, I tried majoring in education as well. But my first education class, I just decided it was not for me. There was no, I, I have one child now, and I will tell you that I do not want to manage 30 of them at the same time. Um, 
And so once I realized that, I knew I needed another backup plan. And I had done um, mock trial in high school um, because I had enjoyed the theater aspect of it. It was like a performance. And I enjoyed it enough that I thought, well, maybe that's the direction I'll go. And so I um, decided to take the LSAT um, and, you know, studied for that and did pretty well and was able to get into the University of Chicago for law school. And so I went up there for three years. I'm from Indianapolis originally. Um, so I went away for school, but I never went too far. I never went a plane right away. I was always a car drive away. So I was like three hours away. Um, partly by my design and partly because my mom really wanted it to be that way. Um, but honestly, I appreciated the car drive because there were a few times that they had to rescue me and, you know, the law school, my apartment elevator broke and they had to come rescue me and things like that where, you know, it was helpful to have that car drive away from my family. Um, but I went to law school and um, was able to get an internship uh, in the summer with my firm. At the time, it was called Baker and Daniels. Um, and I just did a lot of good work for people that summer and the next summer to the point where people really started to know me and wanted to bring me along. And so I was able to get a job offer from the summer um, internship program and at that point um i accepted the job i have been with my firm my entire career um so i have not really jumped around they've worked so well with me um that that they really made me you know want to stick with them so they they have been very accommodating and helpful and making sure that um, my disability isn't a great barrier to my performance and, and have made it easier to do that. Um, back when I started, my um, regional assistant assisted me in just things like getting my lunch and things like that. Um, and when she left, my firm actually offered to help pay for someone to help with that kind of thing. And so they've really been working hard to like make it comfortable with me and it's it's been very impressive um i i sort of chose the niche that i chose in e-discovery um partly because there are not a lot of people that are interested in doing it. it's not an exciting area to a lot of people even though i enjoy it um and it's something that i can do well i can do it from anywhere so um you know, I am I am a litigator, but I have told them that I really can't travel out of state for cases. Um, because to bring an attendant to fly, it could be done, but it would be a very enormous task for me. And so I try to stick with sort of in-state cases or do the pre-work on the cases. But when e-discovery came to me, it was sort of an opportunity to excel from wherever I'm working. Um, and so I kind of jumped on that and have embraced it as a niche. And um, it's been it's been a good ride. I've been there um, 11 years. And I jumped off of the partner track about halfway through my career into the council track because I decided that the work-life balance particularly given disability issues of like time to get up, time to get ready, you know, let's take away from those, you know, 50 hour weeks, 60 hour weeks, 70 hour weeks that other partners are billing. And so I decided that council track kind of fit in with my lifestyle better. Um, and I am on track to do that. Um, I also do improv on the side. So I perform with comedy sports in Indianapolis um, and have a lot of fun doing that. It's it's a blast. 
the pandemic has thrown a bit of a monkey wrench in that, but hopefully get back to it soon. And then the rest of my time and probably a full-time job, um, I have a son that I adopted with my um, ex spouse about three and a half years ago, who also has SMA. And he is nine now and he keeps me hopping. So, um, so I've got a few different jobs going on. Great. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. This is Colleen McCarthy O'Toole from QSMA's Community Support Department. And a huge thank you goes to Jim, Brian, Jenny, and Katrina for their great introductions. For the rest of tonight's session, we're going to go ahead and go over some questions that have come in from our attendees. So the first question that I want to go ahead and ask everyone um, is on the topic of workplace accommodations. Um, that in itself could probably have its own panel. So um, I know everybody probably has a wide range of experiences on accommodations. How have you all managed them in your workplace? What were some of the accommodations that you received or what were the, some of the accommodations that you wanted and you made happen for yourself? I don't know if we wanna go ahead and start with Jim and then we can we can go through with Brian, Jenny and Katrina again in that order. Yeah, I, you know, I, I watched the first webinar of, of this and, and on this one too. I'm going to be a bit of a of a strange duck, if you will, because I've been self-employed uh, since uh, well, really 1988. So most of my adult life, um, you know, I really never went to work because I've worked out of the house. I I I've been self-employed and working out of my house since 1988. So uh, to that end, uh, part of um, accommodations for me is. Uh, you know, maybe one of the reasons I fell into the public safety work is because uh, I always knew I was going to be working in buildings that were ADA uh, accessible. Uh, the sheriff's office, the courthouse, the police department, you know, all of those buildings are ADA compliant. So it, it that part of it made it easier. But as far as uh, accommodations at work, um, well, we, we I built my own house and so there are no steps and I'm able to get around and I've got 36 inch doors. And so uh, I've kind of carved out a niche that's kind of unique to myself. So, Brian? Yeah, I would say during my career, there's been countless like physical um, accommodations made uh, could be something as simple as a, a door opener on a bathroom um, or you know a little bit more involved like underground heated garage parking which i didn't ask for but my boss said eh, we're gonna get that for you and that would take and that would typically take 25 30 years of seniority um at 3m i mean really just countless physical accommodations raising my desk up a little bit getting a tray for the keyboard, you know, as things progressively got weaker for me. I would say there were, you know, others that were, um, that were more along the lines of just, there weren't so much a, a physical accommodation like a door opener, it was just telling my boss or the people that I worked with that I, you know, I I get better energy early in the morning. So I'll be there early, you know, like 6.30, but as the day progresses, I get, I get weaker, I start to fatigue, and I gotta be out of here maybe as early as four because if I don't, I'll be too weak to drive home. So these they were gonna bracket my hours, so to speak, so that you know if I'm not here for a later meeting or I'm logging in from home, that's why. It's not because I'm checking out early or something like that. And it it was those latter accommodations that I think were you know, kind of more difficult to under you know to ask for and, and have people understand that yeah i'm i am getting weaker i'm getting more limited on the hours and, and and some of the things i can do there or i have to do them differently than than other folks and i think that helped a lot because if you don't if you don't bring that up and talk to people about it they might assume some other uh, other reason for that that you know yeah brian's got banker hours he's always out of here at four no matter if we've got a meeting or not so um so yeah the the full range and uh, once again, lucky enough that it's always always been a company that's always accommodated. Hey, I guess I'm sort of uh, similar to Jim in that I'm more of an entrepreneur that has been working for myself. Um, but I do have a couple stories that are apropos, probably. Uh, one, when I was in film and television, well, 
double majoring, but when I was in the television department at our school, they had a, a class that had a stair to go in because it was the control room. And you had to do all the elements in the control room, you had to do the switcher, you had to do every, everything. So it was part of the class in RTV that I wanted to do. So they had to put in a ramp. So once they did, I could do it and I could reach all the different uh, elements, the soundboard, the switcher board, the directing um, to learn how to do that. And I kind of felt at the time that everywhere I went, an accommodation would be made that was left for the person that came behind me. So hopefully I was uh, making a path. And then uh, in professional life, uh, Jeff and I have always uh, kind of, you know, done it on our own and figured out what we needed. Uh, I remember when I was mixing my first feature film, uh, I was blessed to be able to do it universal, but it was like the small stage in the basement where they did American Pie and not a lot of big stuff. And um, uh, I went and I looked at it and it had four stairs, five stairs to get into it. And I'm like, uh-oh, what are we going to do? And at the time, we hadn't moved out here yet. We were staying in a hotel. Um, they were granting us, I don't know if I should have said that, but I had a really sweet deal on the mix uh, because I couldn't afford it any other way. And um, the people there were very kind. And so I, so Jeff and I went back to our hotel and we're like, well, we'll go to Home Depot. We'll get, I'm like advertising for Starbucks, like Home Depot, everybody. I'm like saying all these brand names. Uh, I'm not, I swear, I'm not getting anything for <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so we, we thought we had to get a piece of wood and just figure out our own ramp. And then we get a call at the hotel and they say, um, hey, it's Universal, we want you to come by and see the ramp. We're like, what? You know, because we had never had anybody think about it for us before. But we went in, and not only was it done by the professional car carpenters, it was shellacked, it had railings, it was like crazy awesome. And then later on in my career, when I would mix on other stages that had other stairs, they would build ramps. So I was like, I'm like making everything accessible and they would tell me, well, it's easier. Everybody likes it because when they have like equipment on carts, now they just roll it up the ramp. I'm like, hello, you know, universal design people. But um, it was kind of neat because I was like this trailblazer in Hollywood as far as accessibility. Now, if, if I go to a stage and it's not accessible, I won't work there. Um, you know, it's just not, not cool. But um, I guess those are my two... You know, other than that, you know, Jeff and I are always like on the set of our independent films, the main accommodation that we have to figure out. I mean, hours are long, as you um, know, in the film business, and that's not really a problem with me. It's something I always fight with people's perception because I'm like, I'm sitting down. It's not that hard. I can tell people what to do all day. Um, but you have to make sure there's a bathroom accommodation and, you know, with a big enough because a lot of these stalls and different locations are small. Um, a lot of the actors with disabilities have a big issue in that the honey wagons or the, the restrooms and trailers are not accessible at all. So um, we would always like in a, the last film that I directed, you know, I knew the location, I found an area, we made it only, you know, no one else could use that uh, area, that restroom, but me and put signs on it out of order and you know had enough space uh, to do what we need to do and and so like jim as an entrepreneur i'm always thinking ahead and not just uh, you know having to tell people what i need like i did in high school which is nice and universal we were going to do it ourselves but they did it for us because i think a lot of people are really interested in in helping if they know what you need um and and you do it in a nice way you know um but uh Otherwise, uh, you, you got to kind of have a plan and and be ready to work around it and not um, not stumble on anything that might be in your way. I um, I've had a lot of accommodations as well, just like Brian was saying. Um, my firms worked well with me, and I mentioned earlier they even supported me and having someone come in to help with. Some of the physical care which is um a really amazing and wonderful thing that they're willing to help with that um because i um do not in my state qualify for medicaid so i'm 
pretty much on my own for my care. And so um, to have their help while I'm at work for just light things like making lunch makes it so much easier to get by. Um, but they've really been good at collaborating with me. So a lot of the ideas came from me and some of them came from them. But we were always good at like working together to get ideas and accommodations in place. Um, you know, I came up with the software that I needed. So I have a Dragon dictation on my computer. The firm paid for it. The IT people work with me on it to make sure it gets installed correctly. Um, they had a phone on my computer so that I could answer my phone without having to hit any buttons. Um, I could do it with my mouse. And um, and then I had a desk that went up and down. Um, one thing I was thinking is funny, a lot of these accommodations are now in place for everyone in the firm. Um, they now all have stand sit down desks because they've discovered that ergonomically, that's a good thing. Um, they also now all have their phones on their computer screen. Um, I think it was a money saving option actually in the end, but it's just interesting because I think once they recognize, you know, the benefit of the accommodation, it's kind of what Jenny was saying, it really can, you know, be a universal design issue and it can benefit everyone. Um, they have, the um, pandemic has been interesting um, because everybody is, doing a lot more remote work and things like that. And I think largely that's been to the benefit of people with disabilities like myself, because it's a lot easier to not have to get in at a certain time, drive in, get a ride for me because I don't drive myself. Um, you know, going to meetings in person, I can just do everything from the comfort of my home. And I'm hoping that these accommodations sort of last. I think my firm's going to be pretty good about it. Um, I'm going to, you know, request to stay at home a lot more after after everybody else is back in the office because it's been easier to do it here. Um, I've been able to get a decent amount of sleep because I'm not having to get in at the crack of dawn. You know, I can work from my room. I don't have to commute. Um, so it's just, it's been really nice. And I'm hoping that those accommodations stay for everyone. Um, but I, and I'm, I'm sure I've forgotten a billion accommodations that I've had them do for me, but um, that's the general gist of what they've done, which has been really nice. You know, the pandemic has had a lot of bonuses, I think, for employment yeah. for people with disabilities. Exactly what you said. You know, work at home is going to be a new thing. Businesses are realizing they can save a lot of money and yeah. auto overhead, not having these big office spaces. People save time driving to work, so they, they work longer. They do more. They're more efficient. You know, right. not only that, but uh, meetings. Like, you know how awkward these interviews can be? Well, it, when you're on Zoom, it can be a a lot easier because you don't have that handshake with also the pandemic is kind of getting rid of that awful handshake. I don't know about you guys, but it was always oh, yeah. awkward. You couldn't really do it as well. And it was like uncomfortable. It was like, oh, I don't want to shake hands. Plus germs. People care about germs now where before nobody cared and they'd come into your place of work and sneeze and then you get sick, you know? So it's like everyone now is like on the bandwagon. They're like, let's not get other people sick. And so no one else is getting any other things either. So yeah. I have to be like the glass is half full, but there is kind of a renaissance. Also, people are more accepting now and there is this movement. I just wish it would have been 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, and I think there have been opportunities I've had that I wouldn't have had pre-pandemic. There have been conferences that I would have loved to have gone to. But I couldn't fly out there. I mean, the flight, the attendant, the hotel, all of that was not really a good option. But now they're doing them virtually, or at least offering a virtual option. And it's been kind of an amazing opportunity to go to events that I didn't think I was going to make it to. 
Yeah, I, I would add that along those same lines, the working from home that puts everybody in the same playing field, right? It's been the great equalizer, I think, because I, um, I feel it's a it's like a fair ball game now with all my my peers because I don't meeting to meeting I don't struggle getting from one to another through the elevators different floors different buildings um, that's easy I don't have to worry about getting my laptop from one place to another from meeting to meeting I don't have to worry about can I take notes in this meeting room because the table's high enough so it's completely leveled the playing field even presentations are. A snap, you know, before I was, I didn't know if I could, you know, could they see me behind the podium? Can I mic up? Um, none of that matters anymore. So, um, yeah, I really, I really hope it's, you know, 50% plus work from home um, when we come out of this, which I think most of the employees would like it that way anyways. Mm -hmm. I, I did a, I did a speech in Prague over the 2020, like, I'm like, wow, that was different, you know, yeah. so world traveling now and uh yeah there's a lot of advantages i think especially in the in the workplace great that is all such great input everybody thank you so much and i'm laughing going through even the questions that are coming in and the questions we re we've received you're all doing such a great job on touching on so many of them so it's great we, we've gotten several questions about disclosing your disability in the interview process and i know this doesn't apply to everybody but just wanted to see, um, you know, when you were um, interviewing in an interview process, did you disclose your disability? And if so, when did you do that? And if you can just tell us a little bit more about that. And if you don't have anything to add, you could always just say pass as well. But Jim, do you want to start again? Um, as far as interviews go, I really have not interviewed for a job for me. Um, much much like you know you guys would do that however what i do do is i do do presentations uh, especially when i did the uh, consulting work at, whereby you know i would come into a county commissioner's meeting and then you know there'd be people all over and i would explain to them what i do why they should hire me and so in essence yeah that was an interview because i was uh, asking for work to the county commissioners or the mayors or city council and people along that line so it, it was an interview, but it was always done in public. And uh, to that end, I don't ever recall uh, mentioning my uh, disability because it was the elephant in the room. I, it was obvious that um, you know, I had a disability. I, I, I'm a very good type three, so I've been walking most of my life. I've been in a chair the last uh, about six years. Uh, so I did a lot of these interviews standing up. But as most of you remember or know, if you know a type three, you know, standing up is not a normal uh, operation. And so, um, yeah, it was the elephant in the room, but, you know, I never talked about it. Um, my focus was on, uh, here's the job that you need to have done. Here are my credentials to do it. Now let's get started. So that was more of the attitude that I took um, with uh, what what you would call an interview. Uh yeah, so you know, with me, whenever I did my last interview, obviously it was it was obvious that I had a disability. Um, didn't have to disclose it. Now, if I were to apply someplace today, and you know, I don't, I don't, I think it has to be post offer before you identify an application. But you know, I, I think disability status is not one of those statuses. It doesn't necessarily hurt you in the process, but it doesn't help you like some of the other diversity categories do. There's other diversity categories where people, you know, definitely want to put those down because companies are looking to increase representation in certain areas. Unfortunately, I don't think that's the case with people with disabilities, but I guess at the same time, I don't, I don't think it's a detriment either. Um, I, you know, I've been using a power wheelchair since seventh grade so uh yeah so people kind of know when i roll into the room um also you know even b before when i had uh jobs like through college and stuff before i started my company um if someone asked specifically what my disability was i would tell them um but yeah it wasn't uh, something that i hid uh nor did i have the possibility to hide it um 
but uh, in the film business, uh, yeah, and it, it is the awkward, the only problem was the awkward moment of them feeling funny or them not knowing how they should act and stuff like that. And once I would, you know, make them relax and say something funny or just, you know, uh, they would realize that, you know, we had other things in common, that it would be better. Um, but in the room, um, specifically in writers' rooms, um, you know, they typically hire people that are like themselves, you know, um, and the turtle that I've always had to get over if trying, you know, I've, I've gone to these diversity hiring things at the DGA and Carl Weathers is there, you know, and he's a, he's Apollo Creed, you know, and he's looking to get a job. And I'm like, wow, who are you going to hire? Me or Apollo Creed? I'm like, I'm going to hire Apollo Creed, you know, so I, amongst the diversity groups for diversity hiring initiatives I always felt like the the minority of the minorities you know um because specifically in the entertainment business you know there's a long um uh you know people are you know it's only recently where they're starting to hire women in in more of those roles so uh there's there's a long way to go to to get in that position where people are hiring you um, to helm, you know, a, a very expensive project. But going after jobs like Jim has in the corporate world, I've done that. I've never had any any uh, problems with that at all. It's um, it's been a really long time since I interviewed, um, and. Um, so I'm trying to remember exactly how it went, but I believe, so some of my strengths, some of my selling points sort of imply disability. So I've published in Quest Magazine for the MBA. I've been on boards for the Governance Council for People with Disabilities, things like that. And so it comes up in my resume that you might imply that there's some kind of disability connection but i don't think that i sort of put it out there you know in a corporate way i don't think that i would have checked the box that like says are you disabled unless i had some reason to know that it was a good box to check um but i but as soon as i'm in the room obviously it's pretty clear um and if you're also I think, you know, when you're doing the interview, you want to make sure that you know that the place you're going is accessible. So you need to either do your research or you're going to have to disclose it before you meet with them so that you don't have an awkward situation where you're sitting outside the building wondering how you're going to do your interview, you know. So I, um, as I recall, I sort of implied it in my resume, but didn't really disclose it outright. But it's no secret once I roll through the door. So um, it came up at that point. And then I, I think the, I, I did not bring up my disability in the interview. Um, I believe that they may have asked at some point what accommodations I thought might be useful to me. Um, and I felt safe answering that question. I mean, I didn't like, list out every dream accommodation but i felt safe answering it to discuss some of the basic accommodations that would make it easier to do my job um so we had that conversation but i was not the one to initiate it in that situation i i think also that i've had the most success in thinking back in interviews is when i didn't want the gig you know it's like when there was no pressure and you're relaxed and you like don't care, uh, then I would always get it. So <laughs> I've kind of tried to adopt that uh, since then and like just go and be like, I'm not going to get it anyways, uh, which seems like a defeatist attitude, but then it takes all the pressure off and then, then you're more relaxed and sometimes you get it. That's great. Thank you all so much. We have a few related questions I'm going to kind of merge together. Um, you know, actually, Brian had actually touched on this one. And the first one is, how do you cope with fatigue from working, you know, full-time schedules? 
And then other questions just on balancing um, your health with your SMA and your busy careers. Um, how do you find yourself being able to balance all of that at once? We want to start with Jim again, then go around. Yeah, balance is important. Um, you know, one of the things I've always uh, told people is I, I always make sure that I, I exercise, I eat right, and I get enough sleep. Um, and, I, and I do, you know, all three uh, fairly well uh, on a consistent basis. Um, it, it doesn't bother me at all uh, if I, especially if I've hit most of the things I want to do on the week uh, for the week uh, to to pull out of here on Friday afternoon, go to the gym, exercise, and then come back. Um, and actually, you know, take time away from work uh, in order to to do that. Uh, it, it's critical. Um, so I, as far as balancing everything goes, um, nothing in excess. And I and I do try to, you know, again maintain a good diet and exercise and and sleep, um, which means you know I don't I don't watch a lot of TV. I don't do a lot of things that um, a lot of folks, normal folks, do do. Um, simply because the focus is not there. The focus is on making sure uh, that I am as good as I can be. I don't compare myself with uh, healthy people. I don't compare myself with people who have the disease. I just uh, make sure that I'm as good as I can be. And uh, if, if I'm rowing that boat okay, then you know everything else should fall in line. Yeah, so agree with Jim, finding the right you know balance of activity, the diet that works for you, the amount of rest that you need. Um, a big part of the, uh, you know, me getting the best out of my work day is just understanding when my best energy was, which for some odd reason is really early in the morning. Um, I do better than thinking better, um, don't fatigue as quickly. Um, and then I'd use that, you know, acknowledgement and, you know, schedule the most important meetings of the day during that time frame. Um, maybe stay away from Mondays because it takes me a little while to get longer. So I would, I would kind of, you know, package my schedule together in a day or, you know, in a week when I knew I was going to be, you know, more peak, um, the meetings that, that mattered, or if I had to give a presentation meetings that didn't matter as much, maybe even Friday afternoon or something like that. But I understood when I was going to feel better and when I wasn't. Um, I think the other thing is just, you know, accepting, the kind of the next the next level of help one might need as far as okay i'm gonna have to work a day from home every week um if i want to keep doing this or i'm going to have to maybe occasionally someone's going to need to drive me to work instead of me doing it because i just can't do it every day and just being okay with making those you know giving up a little ground um and just you know being okay with that so it continues to extend um your you know your productivity and how long you can work um i you know i definitely got the goal of making it at least a retirement in in uh, in mind and i think i got a game plan to get there so earlier i said i had a lot in common with jim unfortunately this is where we 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 separate jim everyone listening should do what jim and brian are saying i'm the opposite I don't eat right, I don't exercise, and I don't get enough sleep. And I watch a lot of TV and movies because that's the business I'm in. Um, I'm sort of like the rebel. Everything you should do, I don't do. Um, I'm always fighting with like potential, uh, you know, uh, hires. Like they think that I would be fatigued, but um, I mean, to a certain extent, everything Brian says is true. I, I, I you know, went through if I don't drive anymore, and you have to know when. It's time, you know, um, I had family that was afraid that I would never give it up because I loved it so much, which I did, but, um, and that I would, you know, hurt somebody. But once it got to where I didn't feel like I was the best driver on the road, which I was at one time, I was awesome. Um, once I, I passed that and I didn't feel comfortable anymore, I didn't want to hurt myself or anybody else. And so there are transitions that come uh that you have to be ready for but but as far as being healthy and doing the right things i am the poster child for not doing the right things and being the rebel and uh but you know coffee helps you know a little bit of coffee i make it through the day with no sleep um you know sometimes you know we're working nights you know on a shoot so i'm up all night and then in the daytime so the sleep patterns but um 
but uh, you know, it, it 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 works for everybody, and you have to know when you're pushing it too much, and make sure you hydrate when you can, and and stuff like that, and and try try to be better as you get older. I'm trying to not be such a rebel, but uh, do what those guys did. Don't do what I do. Uh, I um I split the balance. I guess I I don't eat well. I watch plenty of TV. Uh, but I get enough sleep, I think. <laughs> um, hey, there's there's nothing wrong with TV now. TV no, is uh, a wrong. great thing. Everybody should watch more. <laughs> watch my stuff. Don't forget, um, watch Cinemability. If you're going to watch something, Jim, that's what you need to watch. So I, um, you know, I think one thing that I recognize, so my biggest challenge with my balancing disability and work for me has been that it takes me a while to get ready in the morning and it takes me a while to get to bed at night and so i lose a good three or more hours of my day doing those things and um when i was trying to keep up with my um, fellow associates and work the same number of hours that they were working I didn't recognize that like they didn't have that three hour loss of time that I did. And they were probably getting better sleep than me. Um, so that's when I kind of got off the hamster wheel a little bit and decided that council track was probably more designed for what I really had time for in my life and in my day. As in particular, that was after I had gotten married. Um, and was contemplating adoption, I, I knew that there was going to be other things pulling on my time. So when I stepped into that council role, I was able to take a reduced hour schedule. It's still plenty of hours. It's, you know, I'm at like 85% or something, 89% of what other people are at, but it makes it easier to do it. Um, and so I, I actually get more sleep than I did before. The other thing that has happened since the pandemic is that I've sort of shifted my times that I'm working. So I tend to be working more from 10 until 6 or 7 instead of, you know, being in the office at 9 a.m. Because if I was in the office at 9 a.m., I had to be up before 7, maybe 6.30 in the morning. And, and I tend to be a night person. So I, you know, didn't want to be in bed at eight o'clock at night just to get my sleep um so i've been able to kind of shift that as long as i because i'm working from home if i need to be on a call before that time i just do it while i'm getting ready i can make it work um here and so i've sort of shifted the hours to what works well with my schedule so that i can actually get eight hours of sleep and it's been a game changer to get those eight hours of sleep i I was like falling asleep in my office, you know, not falling asleep fully, but sort of that embarrassing dozing um, all too often before uh, when I was only getting seven hours. So, and, and I don't find my arms as fatigued. Um, I don't find my voice as fatigued. So I think all of that has improved by getting those eight hours of sleep. Um, I still eat junk. I probably shouldn't, but I, um we'll see if one day that changes but for now at least get my eight hours <laughs> that's great thank you all so much so we have one last question um we have so many teenagers young adults and college students watching tonight as well as so many of their parents do you each have any advice to all these young adults um, and or to their parents and again if we just want to start in the same order with jim first uh, in this case, I will say do what Jenny does, and that is follow your passion. Um, yeah, you have to understand you're not going to be a policeman, but you can be a dispatcher. You're not going to be an airline uh, pilot, but you can be a, a air traffic controller. Uh, so there are limits. Uh, but if uh, aviation's your thing, then do something in aviation. If uh, public safety is your thing, do something in public safety. There are opportunities. I've been a volunteer with a local volunteer fire department in my area for many years. I was an EMT for many years when I was uh, able to get around. 
but when it came to the point where, you know, my being on scene was more of a hindrance and, you know, obviously you got to be aware of that. Uh, there are still lots of jobs for me to do. I can be the president or the treasurer, uh, help out with the fish fry. I mean, it sounds like something that would be kind of far-fetched to be part of a volunteer fire department, but it's not. So follow your passion, uh, find what your niche is. It may not be exactly what you want to do, but uh, there are things that you can do that you will enjoy and hopefully uh, never work a day in your life, I think is the way Jenny put it. So follow her passion there. That's, uh, that's good advice. I'll, I'll maybe just give advice that has nothing to do with a disability is so, you know obviously you want to pick a career path that you're interested in but you know pick one that's in demand and like data science ai machine learning that whole space um when you get to a point where you're applying for a job and you you get hired you can basically write your own check it's like the most severe shortage of um you know, employees in a field that's ever we've ever seen, and it's a great field for people with disabilities. Um, you, I mean, it, it can accommodate just about any disability, and uh, companies are dying for it. There's not enough of the people, not enough people that have that skill set. So, check that out. Cool advice for everything. I, I, I guess I'll talk to the parents for a second and say, don't limit your kids for fear of something that could happen to them or, or you know, even going to college. I mean, there's a lot of big steps. Luckily, my uh, parents were great and taught me that there was no such word as can't, which I guess is why I'm in the movie business, but uh, not, uh, right, not a really smart choice, but it's fun. And I think that as far as uh, anybody that's younger that's watching that themselves have the disability, um, you know, it's a great time. Uh, things are more open now. Uh, and really, there's nothing to stop you for following the American dream. I mean, uh, we were talking earlier, Jim and I, about uh, Ralph Braun, who had SMA, who started, you know, his family. He told me that when he was growing up, he was embarrassed once because he had to go to school wearing a shirt that his mom made for him out of a potato sack. They were so poor and he before anybody had a vehicle with a ramp invented you know the wheelchair lift and became a multi-millionaire and nothing stopped him and he was the forerunner i mean think of everything that we owe our ability to travel and to go to work but it's all here now even the people that fought for curb cuts you know we've come a long way and there's really nothing that should stop you now from following your heart and, and finding a way. At, I tell people often, you know, find that thing that you would do even if they didn't pay you to do it and then find a way of making money at it. And so I guess that's my best advice. So Jimmy stole some of my, my advice, I think. Um, I was going to say to the parents, don't get in your child's way. It's hard. Um, I also am a parent of a child with SMA and I want to, you know, keep him safe. I want to protect him, but I also know that that's not going to serve him. My mom told me she learned a while ago that there wasn't any point in getting in my way once I had an idea. It happened anyways, um, and and I want to be that parent to my child as well. I want to be the parent that lets them set their mind and they figure out a way instead of instead of making excuses or reasons why they shouldn't do it. Um, for for the kiddos, um, for the teenagers out there, I I would say be um be bold know that you're worthy don't feel like you have to compare yourself to other people it's not about what other people are doing whether they have sma whether they don't have sma it's about um doing what you want to do as successfully as you can however you define that and um and look for supports Look for supports in your family, but look for supports out in the world. 
find friends that will will be there for you find professors to mentor you um and make connections wonderful thank you so much jim katrina jenny brian uh thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today and share all of this uh, input and for this just organic, very helpful uh, conversation we've had today. Thank you so much again. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees who have listened in tonight. You'll be receiving a follow-up email that'll have a survey link, and we'd greatly appreciate any feedback that you have to share with us. And again, we're so thankful for the incredible support from Biogen. They are our presenting sponsor and are making this career panel webinar series possible. We hope that everyone will be able to join us again for our next career panel webinar on Monday, November 15th. That will be the final career panel webinar of this year. If there's anything that we can do for you, or if you have any additional questions, please email us at community support at curasume.org. Thank you so much again, Jim, Katrina, Jenny, Brian. Have a great evening, everyone.